just sort of tell you some of the stuff that's going on. I know you guys have had a lot, uh, and you had your session yesterday on uh, some of your community health projects. But I wanted to show you some of the stuff we've done and maybe some opportunities. So, um, So I want to show you a couple of things we have. So this is a book I wrote a while back. Men die young, women don't care. Obviously, I don't have very many friends. Um, but it's trying to get you know FOMs, fat old men, to come in to be seen. So it's kind of written pretty uh, tongue in cheek. I have a second version that's about ready to be launched with a medical student. So again, there are these things called self-publishing books. So I published this a while back. Um, it went to number one on Amazon because I told all my friends one day. Like this day, it's going to be 99 cents. I've got a bunch of friends. Everybody buy it <laughs> for 99 cents. And I was number one for one day on Amazon. And then you take a screenshot. So that's something you can do. Um, the second one we did with a bunch of students was this one. We published it this year. Sports Medicine Treatment Terrorist Approach. So if anyone is interested in, like, for example, doing a scribe book or any book, they're, they're actually not that hard to self-publish. That's something that when they Google search you, when you apply, that's what will come up. Um, the other thing that we have is um, we, uh, Matt, uh, who was helping me the day before, we just started this this week, or yeah, this, well, this, this year. This is our medical, IE medical scribe page, which I think he might have mentioned if you guys to look at some of the videos and stuff we have. So um, we have, we try to put together all the best videos. If you guys could kind of, help in terms of like, if you find a good video, you want to put it on there, if you want to help in any way, it's the kind of thing we're happy to put your name on this so that you get credit and you can be part of that. So again, it's all pretty inclusive. Um, the other thing is, um, this is a, a website that, um, of course, I'm in charge of, from the Riverside County Medical Association. Peaceful practice website. Sorry, we'll shut that off. This is a website me. me. Well, cool. So what it is, it's, it's exactly what it says. It's a website that, so three years ago we had, um, so I'm the chair of this. So three years ago we had a retreat um, to go up to Arrowhead with the whole Riverside County Board of Counselors. And we kind of came up with what are the big three that we, you know, sort of need challenges on. And one of them was um, uh, lessening the, the EHR burden. So we came up with this and we made some progress, but there's a lot to be done if you're interested. So. One of the things we have, we, we do have uh, resources to try to improve. See, the theory is that we need a team, and so uh, there are what's called medical assistants. That's what most doctors have in their office, but they're not scribes. And so one of the thoughts would be to change them from MAs to MA scribes. You guys will become scribes unless you're already an MA. But there is the ability for you guys to become MA scribes if you wanted to. It just depends on the time-wise and stuff. One of the thoughts we had was, like for example, let's say you're going to go see a patient with a doctor on acne. I think it'd be good to listen to our little YouTube or PowerPoint on acne. You know, three minutes. Here's what acne is. This is the cause of acne. This is how we diagnose this. This is how we treat it. So you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Um, that um, needs some work to be done. Uh, so that's got some exciting things. There is, if you wanted to, and this gets you kind of ready for medical school. Uh, we do have this app that's halfway done. Um, so the woman that helped me with this, she is a college professor going. So with all of this, she got into UCL Med School, so we'll start next year. But she's very open to helping us with this. So one of the thoughts would be to help us to finish the app as a, a scribe, so would have like these YouTubes right on it, like, okay, you're gonna go see somebody with this disease, here's 30 seconds on it or, or two minutes on it. So that's available, and then if you're totally bored and, or you need to fall asleep, you could go to this workflow and see a talk I gave on something we're calling the attending model of medicine. And so this is a lecture, not very good, but it could be revamped on what I think would be the best way for us doctors to work when we become an attending. So, as you know, there's medical students, you know, first, second, third, fourth year, everything's hierarchy. And then you become an intern, and which is really first year residency, then you become a resident, fellow, and then an attending. So, the theory is, 
all of you all want to become attendees. You want to be smart and, as I joke, lazy, where people just tell you stuff and then you come up with a decision. But that's kind of uh, the thought. So anyway, that's available. Um, I did want to mention uh, this is the group that you're going to be getting certified through. So it's the only one that certifies scribes. So understand I'm doing this just for fun. I really want to, I just hate it when doctors commit suicide. Um, I myself would like to have work-life balance, and so it's really hard. All my physician friends are really, really struggling. So the more of you that can become scribes, that would help the docs. Um, so not, you don't have to be certified, but it really looks good on your resume. I think it does help medical legally. Um, so understand, I don't get paid for this. I'm doing this for fun. If you want to throw me a Yelp review, I wouldn't say no. Um, and, uh, I would appreciate that, but what the money is, see that it costs about $300 to get certified if you just went individually. If we pool everyone together, the city will then buy it and we, you guys each save 50 bucks doing it. And then we don't charge you for the internship, I can help you get the internship. If you have time this summer, we can do it, or wherever you go, we can set it up uh, when, you, when you go. So that's the uh, CMS, or the American College of Medical Scribes Specialty uh, website. My understanding, this is what Logan had told me, uh, is that uh, they're going to be buying this for you like the 1st of July. So the first these couple weeks, um, you won't be doing it, but as soon as July hits, then you can study, take the test, we can do all that. Is that pretty much right? Yeah. yeah. And they're going to send you something else on that. Uh, let me see what else I have. No. no, no. Okay. So let's I think get back to the phone. Okay. So I have one eye. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's get started. So we're going to talk about uh, electronic health records. And uh, this is uh, uh, really a, a challenge for all physicians. If you have any um, friends who are doctors or anything, um, talk to them about their charting and then back away because they usually have very strong feelings about it. Um, so when I started a long time ago, they still had paper. And so a lot of the docs were exactly like this. Um, EMRs, which is electronic medical records, and EHRs are just a big waste of time and money. Paper medical records aren't going to be compatible and interoperable. And, and there's something to be said for that. So um, a lot of the docs who started with paper, um, it's hard for them to give it up. You can see how many thousands of pages are there. Um, the challenge with paper charts is that they just aren't, you can't really search them. Um, doctor's writing is doctor's writing. Um, so there was some good and some bad to both of it. But, it was uh, pretty pretty rough, um, and then you know some of the guys just did not want to switch into the technology part. They said that it was, oh, it's this internet thing's not going to go on. And in fact, I like this show. If you guys anyone know who this is, Steve Jobs. So he came up with this Macintosh computer, which I have. I was going to bring mine, but I couldn't get all the way into the garage to get it. So I still have it. So I got this back in 1986. So I was in residency. I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. Uh, this was literally like your first desktop, like there were big ones, and IBM was you know, sort of the bomb, but they were huge, and, and this was something you could literally carry with you, and I did research on it, and I was the first one to bring this into Fallbrook Hospital, which doesn't exist anymore, and I literally like had a printer, and I just was, I did the first like electronic chart, like I just typed it in and had like some little cheat sheets and stuff. It had one meg of RAM, you know, a little disk in it and stuff. Um, and they were like, what are you doing? Because like, no, there was no computers in the whole hospital, like, not even like for the ventilators or anything. And so it's only been one generation that switched over. So um, I'm kind of an early adopter. I like shiny objects. I like technology. Um, a lot of docs don't. And in fact, I was just talking to the president of the CMA who's retired just because he hates computers and stuff. So um, it's, it's a big challenge. And if you guys get good and can help us, um, then I think docs will stay in practice longer. So, uh, electronic health records come in a bunch of different names. So just like there's a bunch of programs, there's a bunch of names. So you'll hear Epic is one of the biggest ones. A lot of big companies use that. Um, Kaiser uses it. A lot of the big uh, uh, universities use it. Athena is one that, that's pretty big. Uh, McKesson is one that some of my friends use. DNA is one that Dr. Combs, uh, so Curtis, there's two Combs, but Curtis Combs, is one of the best uh, family docs in terms of seeing a lot of people in a short amount of time. Uh, together we co-founded the Efficient Care where we did MA Scribes. Um, I've since sort of branched off because I'm really looking at 
converting Ames to Scribe and getting the new Scribe going. And so, but he does a very good job, and it, it, but it's quite expensive. But his program is very small, but very detailed to him, so it's very good. Cerner is what we use at Tobacco Valley Hospital. There's always updates on Cerner. And then I use Practice Fusion because it's the most widely one used by, I have a small group, I just have two offices. And it was free, it, now they just charge 100 bucks, but it's uh, quite good. So um, all of those electronic health records are available and depending on where you go, if you go to um, say uh, Palomar, they might use something different. So just understand that they're all basically the same, but they're all very different and you just have to get used to it. And that's where the docs have a real big challenge. So just so you um, so you can know how we as doctors feel about it, I was going to show you my guy Z Dog on how doctors feel about their EHR. So I just created this dope website, Wix. Let me show you how I did it. First up, go to Wix. He did this at our 
Western leadership. Agency. Yo, it's CWMD. As healthcare professionals and as doctors, we know we need better technology to support what we do every day. So go to www.letdoctorsbedoctors.com and have your voice be heard. Big ups to Athena Health for being the only EHR vendor brave enough to admit that EHRs suck. Subscribe below, check out our other videos, and we out. So I just understand that they can't make a good EHR because they put millions into it. It just has to do with uh, really uh, the social sort of climate of it's really hard to see patients and to do your charging. So, um, so why do we have EHRs? I think I told you last time there's three reasons. One is patient care. Next is billing. You guys don't want to work for free forever. And then the last thing that always kind of curls my stomach is uh, medical legal documentation. So you have to have, that chart has to be like fulfilling all of those. Uh, and it can't be a big, as he calls it, loaded ransom note. Uh, but this is what the docs are going to be working with as a scribe. Understand these are the three things. And so each of those are, are pretty, obviously, very important. But patient care is obviously the most important thing. Uh, the malpractice is really big. Um, having been sued, it's not fun. Um, they say bad things about you and everything you've stood for. So, um, and, and it's, you know, something that you try as much as you can, but, I mean, frankly, every one of my patients is going to die. Everyone's going to have some bad outcome. And the big deal is, you know, did you do everything? And that's what, did you do everything? Did you document everything? So malpractice is a huge thing. If you look at the specialists that get sued quite a bit, 20%, um, it's one in five neurosurgeons. Um, and the, the challenge with this is these cases go on for 10 years. So you know, I, have a, I have a case from 1989 that, you know, basically, you know, it, it turned out okay, but still, for 10 years, we went through this whole thing. And even today, just about every day, I think about it. So the docs get pretty beat up because the whole deal is we will sacrifice, like you guys, are gonna, you're going to sacrifice your 20s going to school. You may even sacrifice marriages, everything to be a good doctor, and then for someone to say you're not a good doctor, you don't care enough, you're not smart enough, it, it, it's pretty bad. And that's one of the reasons for uh, physician suicide, these are all physicians who have passed away. Uh, and, uh, and the challenge is that it's just so much to, to do to, to get this all done. So I did want to talk about uh, this. So this was a, a TED talk, I'll just show you a little bit about that. So this is Pamela Weibel. So she's uh, one of the first to really bring this out. But almost 400 a year. I love the three things that people fear the most death, disease, and public speaking. Here's how it all started. At four, I was so talkative and bossy, no babysitter would stay with me. So I tagged along with mom, a hospital psychiatrist, interviewing suicidal patients. Then she dropped me off at the morgue with dad, a pathologist. He'd open up these big cooler doors and say, Good morning, is anyone home? Then he'd introduce me to his patients as a doctor in training and leave me there talking. My first captive audience. Now I'm a doctor and I'm speaking on behalf of thousands of doctors who couldn't be with us, but they're here in spirit. I simply ask, that you open your heart to their words. Dear Mama and Daddy, I know you may not understand why I didn't seek help, but this choice makes sense to me. I know I would have been such a successful doctor and wife and mother. I love you so much. Your daughter, Caitlin. Date of death, April 11, 2013. Cause of death, asphyxiation by helium inhalation due to untreated depression in medical school. 
Each year, more than one million Americans lose their doctors to suicide. Across the country, our doctors are jumping from hospital rooftops, overdosing in call rooms, found hanging in hospital chapels. It's medicine's dirty secret, and it's covered up by our hospitals, clinics, and medical schools. No medical school wants to be known as the suicide school. No hospital wants to be number one for interns jumping from rooftops. No one wants to become a doctor to kill themselves. It's the ultimate oxymoron, the barefoot shoemaker, the starving chef, the suicidal doctor. So why? What the hell is going on? And why is it such a secret? And why am I piecing this together between patients? I'm a solo family doc, yet somehow I've become an investigative reporter, a specialist in physician suicide. Why? Mostly because I can't stop asking why. Why both doctors I dated in med school died by suicide? Why eight doctors killed themselves just in my sweet little town? So I keep talking and writing and listening for the truth. So anyway, you can see it's a bad, bad deal. So, but I, I think there's hope, and this is sort of part of it. So, um, one of the thoughts is that, um, you know, when you look at physician, it usually starts with physician burnout. So the burnout, as you can see, has to do with a lot of it is um, spending too many hours at work, bureaucratic tasks, and then increasing computerization of your practice. So these are all things that I think if we can help, uh, then, then physicians can stay alive, patients can keep their doctor, people get a, you know, access to affordable health care in a culturally sensitive manner. So what seems to be the problem is, Johnson, I feel the way you look. So I do think the docs need to be the change they want to see in the world. We should be healthy. We should be balanced. Um, but the challenge is, if you're looking at a screen instead of looking at the patient, the examination feels like you're at the DMV. You know, anybody been to the DMV? <laughs> they, they don't really look at you. They, they just kind of next and kind of do that. Anyway, nothing negative against DMV. I'm sure there's some very nice people there. But just the setup is pretty rough. And you look at the eye contact there, it is, it's pretty bad. And so physicians really need to be able to look at their patients, because I'm really like Sherlock Holmes, which I highly recommend you read all those books. And you look at people's shoes, and you can tell she's pretty athletic, and he's very well groomed. You know, you just look at everything about patients, because I'm looking at everything to try to piece it all together. And so, this is what happens sometimes. Wow, your cholesterol really has to be worried. But then the lady's like, well, you might want to actually look at the patient. And, and they found that, you know, less than half the time, the physicians are looking at the patient, uh, especially if you've been to you know, some place where the, you know, where the computer is, they got to get their notes done, they're looking at the computer, that sort of thing. So, can it be done? Yes. Is it optimal? No. So, it, there is something to be said for what's called eye gazing. What I highly recommend you guys get good at is eye, ga eye gazing, because they're going to ask you or evaluate you on how good your listening skills are. So, I got to tell you my little secret. Um, so, every time I see a patient, I'm I'm sports medicine, all I do is play games. So one of my games is eye gazing. And this comes from Tim Ferriss. Some of you might have listened to his podcast. He's got some great books. One of the books is called The Four Hour Work Week, which is your guys' goal to work one hour a day, four days a week. Do not work 40 to 50 hours a week for 50 years or 40 years and then die. You want to work, you want to get telehealth, get everything all together, get all your work done in an hour so you have work life balance. But um, he does a thing called eye gazing because most of us don't want to look at each other's eyes um, or you know, when your mom's or dad's, you know, you, you know, sort of talking to you, and if, or especially if, if you have a girlfriend and you're looking at ESPN, <laughs> and she's talking, that's not a good situation, because they want to have you look at them. I would look at you with my eyes pretty bad right now. So, it's, um, but what I do when my eyes not like this, is I actually have, and he, uh, Tim Ferriss has this little game where it's like speed dating and speed gazing. You'd go and you just look at the other person for two minutes and not say anything, just look at their eyes. And so my little game is, and I get really good marks and people don't know it's a game, is I do all the behavioral stuff that makes me seem like I'm listening. I am listening, but this way I get credit for listening. I sit down, put my hands like this, there's TED Talks and everything. So I have hands like this, um, I lean in, and I just look at one eye, and I don't blink until they blink. 
I always like have a contest, like, and I win every time because they don't know we're playing the game. <laughs> and but they just think I'm like this fantastic listener, and, and I am listening, but I'm getting credit because I'm really eye gazing. And so um, we did a study that, um, you, and this one was this one is on cancer that doctors prefer, <coughs> when patients prefer the doctor not have computers in the exam room. Uh, our uh, pro, our, our uh, uh, article that got published, and this is sort of the sort of the example what I'm I'm hoping with you guys. So uh, Ashley was in FPL and then she became basically Devin. <laughs> she ran it. And then we matched her with uh, Hannah, who's a med student of mine. And so we published, and they, what they did is video me just taking care of 100 patients. And how much time did I spend in the room? And how much time did I spend looking at the patient? And while if you don't have a scribe, you spend about 45% of your time looking at the patient, I spent 93% of the time looking at the patient. And yet I was, my average time, and I didn't know my time, I wasn't doing it back then, was eight minutes a patient. So in eight minutes, I got five-star ratings, got everything done, and it's a, just a better way to see patients. So I can see a nice, brisk volume of patients because they'll go in, they'll get all the history. It's almost like setting in the clone. I go in, and I call it the attending model of medicine. I present, so I don't take a history. I actually give the history to the patient. I tell them when they come in. So my understanding is you have this, 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 this going on. So this comes from Stephen Covey's first seek to understand before being understood. In any sort of debate, like if you're like, hey, you know, um, I, I want this. Um, once the other person can tell you what you want to your satisfaction, that's very powerful for the other person. Because then you know that they know. Like you've talked to me like, you don't even understand what I'm talking about. But if the patient knows that I know, and I put on a little show, and I use very flowery language, everyone's younger than stated age, everyone's, you know, well built and, you know, engaging. I mean, you just sort of, I'm very good and very quickly to get them to at least be neutral with me, as soon as I understand what they want and what they think they have, then I spend 80% of my time on the physical exam. And, and they love that. And there's a whole thing on that. So bottom line is there's other ways to see a good number of people. I'm not trying to rush, but it's in a very effective way. And people feel like I know what they have. Um, I know their story. I can, you know, I can give them their story. Then I lean in. Is there anything else? They have a chance to because it gives them a second chance to look at the, um, at the history. So you'll find as you go through that patients change their history just like you would if someone asks you a question, the next person comes in and asks them, well, I'm going to give you a better answer because I've had a chance to think about it. So anyway, this is the kind of articles you can publish. We're happy to help you guys um, to sort of help this. And this has actually got national attention. I got called by Medicare and interviewed, and we're, we're doing some pretty exciting stuff. So, so my thought is, and this comes from Curtis Combs uh, sort of thing, is using medical scribes. So in a perfect world, medical assistant scribes, but frankly, electronic, I mean, uh, uh, medical scribes is actually quite good also. So the history of scribes, when you're telling your parents you're going to the scribe thing, I'm sure those that were like sort of Christian or new from the past, that scribes are not well liked by Jesus. Uh, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. So. That is not your goal to lock people out. <laughs> that kind of scribe. Um, understand, we doctors think of it this way: doctors save lives, scribes save doctors. So, as uh, you've heard, you guys are going to be very, very valuable once you learn this. Now, you're going to, for lack of a better term, suck for the first couple of hundred charts. Stay thick skin, stay with it, keep learning. But once you get good at it, you'll be using this the rest of your life. You guys will essentially be second-year medical students when this is when you, once you learn how to scribe, because that's what I'm teaching the first and second years now to do this. So you're going to use this, as uh, Tanner said, he like really looked well his first year because he's way ahead. So this is hard to learn; don't get frustrated. But once you learn it, you'll have this the rest of your life, and it'll be very, very good. And being able to write a good note is unbelievably good. Now that being said, there's something called HIPAA. So HIPAA is about uh, compliance in terms of security. Like you can't, anything you see or hear, you can't go spread that to anybody. I mean, you can't even tell your girlfriend, your mom, your dad. Anything. You could sue general stuff, like I saw, pretty well patient, but nothing that would identify that. Because this is the, um, a, you know, you have to have like a confidentiality with it. And if you do it, you 
could go to jail, that kind of stuff. So let's do a joke. Ready? Knock, knock. Yeah. HIPAA. HIPAA. I can't tell you. <laughs> So that's, that's your HIPAA joke, so I have to remember. That's like a dad joke. <laughs> so, now that we've scared you, this is what our goal is, for you guys to be able to write this after your name. So, CMSS. -S. So it would be like Mary Jane, call it CMSS. And that's what you'll be able to write. Now when you pass the test, you'll be a CMA. So you're an apprentice until you've done your 200 hours. So, um, so what we're going to do, this will start like in July, so in two weeks. Uh, you'll sign up through the American uh, Medical Scribes Specialty website. 